The Peter Schiff Show. The big news was yesterday when Fed Chairman Jerome Powell basically flinched. Now, I've been talking about the game of chicken that the Federal Reserve has been playing with the markets. And the way the game of chicken goes is the markets keep moving lower and the Fed keeps talking about how great the economy is and how many rate hikes are coming in the future. And somebody has to flinch. Somebody has to blink, right? It's like you have these two automobiles driving towards each other and there's going to be a major crash unless somebody uh, turns the wheel. And it seems like it was Jerome Powell uh, that turned the wheel first and, in fact, was chicken. As much as the Fed wants to pretend they don't care about the stock market and they're not worried about the stock market, they absolutely care about the stock market. They are worried tremendously about a weakening stock market. Remember, the goal of quantitative easing was to lift the stock market to create a wealth effect. And it was that stock market created wealth that was going to drive consumption and the economy. And it wasn't just the stock market. It was the real estate market. And so the Fed is worried about all asset prices, not just the stock market. Clearly, the real estate market is in even more trouble than the stock market. But both of these markets were headed lower. And I think that is what really prompted uh, the Fed to to blink, uh, to swerve in this game of chicken. Now, of course, you also had uh, President Trump uh, pressuring the Fed. You had Mnuchin uh, putting some pressure on the Fed, which I think should also be a worrying factor because we don't really know, right? There's a lot of speculation what was behind the Fed's change of heart, change of policy. Because after all, up until yesterday, even when you had the vice chair speak, uh, the tone was very hawkish. Yep, we got lots of rate hikes coming. And now all of a sudden, uh, Powell dials it all back. And basically what Powell said that has convinced people that maybe there's not going to be as many rate hikes in the future as the markets had believed is that now Powell is saying, we're just below neutral. We're almost there. Maybe one more rate hike ought to do it, and we're going to be at neutral. I mean, first of all, we're still at 2%. So that would imply neutral is two and a quarter, two and a half. I mean, that really shows you how low the neutrality bar has been lowered given the enormity of the debt bubble that we have. Because once upon a time, and not too long ago, a 2.5% Fed funds rate would have been considered highly stimulative to the economy, especially when you have inflation running at two and a half, three percent based on the government numbers, which, of course, are understating inflation. But even if you take the government's numbers at face value, we still have real interest rates that are negative or about zero. And negative rates or 0% real rates have historically always been considered stimulative, not neutral. So why is it now neutral? And the reason is because we now have so much debt that we can't handle what used to be neutral. Because if the Fed actually raised rates to a historically neutral position, everything would implode. We can't handle neutral anymore. So as a result, the neutral rate has to be moved lower to a rate at which the Fed thinks the markets can tolerate it. But, you know, the joke's going to be on the Fed because we can't tolerate uh, two and a half or two. I don't think this is neutral. If you think neutral is what props the economy up, I think that given the enormity of the debt bubble, that they've already moved beyond neutral. I mean, neutral was probably zero. They probably needed to stay there. Although eventually things are going to fall apart at zero because inflation was going to rear its head and, and rain on the Fed's party, which is what's going to happen anyway. You see, as much as the Fed wants to declare uh, the neutral rate or bring the neutral rate lower and lower to deal with an ever increasing debt burden uh, that needs to be financed at low rates, the Fed can't do this forever because eventually the markets get wise, the dollar tanks, inflation picks up, and now the Fed is forced to raise interest rates and they can no longer maintain the artificially low levels that are necessary to uh, keep this bubble from deflating. So because Powell said that we're now near neutral, now the markets do not believe 
that as many rate hikes are coming. And as a result, the Dow rallied 600 points. One of its biggest up moves of the year, maybe it was the biggest, I'm not sure, 2.5% move in the Dow Jones, just based on a couple of words from the chairman of the Federal Reserve. Now, of course, we got some more words today. We got the release of the minutes, uh, which really uh, you know, didn't amount to much because you know, it was uh, taken second fiddle to what happened yesterday, so it really was kind of a non-event. But even those minutes did confirm that the Fed is now more data dependent than they were in the past, as if they ever really were data dependent. But what that means is the Fed is looking more closely at the economic data. They're not so much on autopilot for future rate hikes. They're going to be looking at the data and determine whether or not they need to raise interest rates more or maybe pause or who knows, maybe even cut rates. In fact, if you read the minutes, they even uh, write about the possibility of having to relaunch quantitative easing uh, during the next recession, which is exactly what they're going to do. The next recession is much closer than they think. And of course, they're going to have to administer a much larger dose of quantitative easing uh, than they believe. And of course, it is not going to be effective. It is going to uh, produce an overdose and destroy uh, the dollar. But as I've been saying, I never thought that the Fed simply indicating a pause in the rate hikes or a slowdown in the rate hikes would be enough to save the market. I mean, I did say that I thought the market could have a knee-jerk reaction to a more dovish Fed. And in fact, we had that knee-jerk. But I still believe that that's not going to be enough. I do believe that this is still a bear market rally. I don't believe that this correction is over and the bull market is going to continue based on this. I still think that the only way the Fed is going to really put a bottom beneath the market is to cut rates. Not to just talk about a slowdown in future hikes, but the market's going to need a much bigger drug than that. Right. We are a huge addict. We've got a big debt problem uh, and we need a lot more than just talking about maybe getting some drugs in the future. We actually need the drugs right now. So I do think that this game of chicken is going to continue, that the markets are going to roll over and make new lows. And the Fed is going to have to do a lot more than just talk about maybe not raising rates as much in the future. In fact, the data that we continue to get, data that we got today data that we got yesterday continue to support the fact that the economy is slowing down. The unemployment claims that come out every week, they came out this morning and it was the the highest number, 234,000 was the weekly claims. And this was the highest number in six and a half months. And if you remember on one of my podcasts last week, following the release of the claims, I said that based on that jump and the upward revisions to the prior month, that I thought that we had seen the low in claims, potentially. We had a bottom. And what we had this week is more evidence of a bottom. I think if we get above 240,000 claims next week, that will be an even greater uh, evidence that we've seen the lows. And what does that mean? That means that we're going to start to see higher and higher first-time unemployment claims being filed. Well, what does that mean? Well, that means the unemployment rate is going to go up. And one of the things that the Fed and everybody else have been hanging their hat on for a strong economy is how low the unemployment rate is. So as the unemployment rate starts to uh, notch up, then fewer people are going to be able to say, hey, look how low the unemployment rate is. Uh, People are going to start to worry about an increasing unemployment rate and what that means about the economy. Now, of course, when people see the unemployment rate moving up, everybody's going to say, aha, see, this neutralizes the inflation threat because a lot of people incorrectly believe the inflation threat comes from employment, comes from people working, comes from a growing economy. And as I've said many, many times on this podcast, Growth never causes inflation or never causes consumer prices to rise. If anything, growth causes consumer prices to fall or prevents them from rising because real economic growth means the economy is producing more stuff. You have more output. You have more production. You have more supply. And so that keeps a lid on prices. When supply goes up, price can come down. What makes prices go up is an increase in the money supply, right? Inflation. And when you have a weak economy, then you have 
uh, less production, that might tend to push up prices. But what really pushes up prices in a weak economy is when the government fights their weakness by printing even more money, when they run even more deficits that need to be monetized. And then you get stagflation, which is where we're headed. Now, one of the reasons that prices are not rising even faster now is because of these trade deficits that we have. We are able to import goods that we don't produce to offset the fact that our economy is not as productive and we get to export all the money that we're printing. So that is keeping a lid on prices. They're, they're rising anyway. But once the dollar turns around, uh, then prices are going to move up even faster. So the increase in the unemployment rate is not actually going to provide relief from inflation. But in the short run, the markets are going to think so. The Fed is going to think so. And so as the unemployment rate goes up, then more and more people are now going to start to price out their expectations for rate hikes in 2019. I mean, so far, everybody is still looking for a rate hike in December, uh, which is just a few weeks away. Uh, But most people now, or a lot of people are dialing back their expectations for March or for June. But of course, if the economic data continues to weaken, it is still possible that the Fed does not raise rates in December. And as I said before, if they punt on December, that's it. That's the end of the rate hikes because the data is only going to go downhill from there. And so if the data is so bad or the market is so weak that they can't go in December, then they're they're never going to go. And in fact, speaking about the trade deficit, which is helping to keep inflation at bay, or at least the effects of inflation at bay, we got the numbers yesterday for the merchandise trade deficit. That's the trade deficit just in goods. It excludes our surplus in surpluses. And the number was supposed to come out at $76.9 billion. And that was going to be an increase from the prior month, the September number, of $76 billion. Well, first of all, we revised the September number up to $76.3 billion. But then the October number came out at $77.2 billion, so above expectations. In fact, that is the biggest merchandise trade deficit in the history of the republic. And the reason the trade deficit went up is because exports dropped 0.6% and imports edged up 0.1%. So here you have Donald Trump talking about this export boom and how we're winning the trade war. Meanwhile, exports tanked, and this is the biggest merchandise trade deficit in U.S. history. Right? He keeps talking about how this is the greatest economy in history. That's not true. But what is the greatest in history are our trade deficits. So in other words, America has never lost as much on trade as we are losing right now under Donald Trump. But of course, Trump is not going to let the facts get in the way of his stump speeches. right? And he keeps talking about how not only is this the greatest economy, but how we are winning the trade war, how his tariffs are helping us win. Now, I don't know if the tariffs are the reason that the trade deficit is a record high. It would probably be at a record high even if we didn't have the tariffs. But clearly, you can't say the tariffs are helping. Clearly, you can't say we're winning anything when the losses are greater now than they ever were before Trump was elected president. In fact, one of the reasons that the stock market uh, rallied today, although the Dow did finish negative and all the major indexes were negative. Not not a big move following yesterday's surge. But we were down on the Dow, I think, close to 200 at the lows. And then Donald Trump started talking about the fact that he thinks a deal with China uh, is there, is possible. And so the markets like that. But then he qualified his remarks by saying that, you know, he wasn't sure he wanted to do it. Like he thought there was a deal But he didn't think he wanted to do the deal. He wasn't sure because he said he likes the situation the way it is now because he likes all the revenues that we're getting from the tariffs. Now, I guess it hasn't dawned on Donald Trump the source of that money. See, he thinks it's great that all this tariff money is flooding into Washington, right? All this tax money, right? He doesn't think tariffs are taxes, but that's in fact what they are. It's just a specific type of tax. A tariff is a tax, right? You can have an excise tax. You can have an income tax. uh, You can have a duty, an impost tariff, right? It's just a name for a particular category of taxes, but it's a subset, a subcategory of taxes. So, but apparently Trump doesn't think it is a tax, or if it is, he thinks 
thinks it's a tax on the Chinese, and he wants the Chinese to keep on paying it because America is getting all this cash. But the source of that tax money is the American consumer. It's Americans who buy the products that are subject to the tariff tax. They're, that It's out of their pockets that the money that Trump loves getting is coming from. So when Trump says he loves getting the money, the question is, do the American consumers love paying the money? I don't think so, especially if they understood uh, that the tariffs are being paid by them because the way everybody talks about it, the way the media reports it. In fact, they're talking now again about more uh, tariffs on automobiles. Trump, again, is very upset, as I mentioned on the prior podcast, about the fact that GM is laying off a bunch of workers and closing some plants. And so he's saying we need these tariffs. We need to hit the Europeans with tariffs. Again, the Europeans don't get hit with tariffs. It's the Americans who want to buy European cars. They get hit with tariffs. And if they don't buy European cars to avoid the tariffs, they end up buying more expensive uh, domestically produced cars uh, because they don't want to pay the tariffs. But either way, the Americans either pay more to avoid the tariffs or they pay the tariff. It's not uh, free money coming in uh, from, from China or anybody else. But apparently the markets didn't focus on that. We got the rally based on the fact that Trump thinks a deal is is possible. And again, I think a deal is coming because I think the consequences of these tariffs actually kicking in are going to be enormous. And again, that's another game of chicken that Trump maybe is playing with the Chinese. But in this case, uh, Trump has to flinch. He cannot allow this this crash to happen because once these tariffs are there, uh, the damage is going to be rather severe to the U.S. economy. So the thing for Trump is he could talk about this empty threat all he wants, but at the end of the day, he's got to do something to defuse it because he can't actually impose the tariffs and then he can't not do it, right? If they don't have a deal and he doesn't impose the tariffs, well, then he really looks bad. So the only way to avoid the tariffs, the, the, the higher tariffs, and save face is to come up with some kind of deal. But at least we know from past experience, it doesn't even matter what the deal is, right? Just like NAFTA 2.0, it doesn't matter what it is because whatever it is, he's going to claim it's the greatest deal in the history of deals, right? So it doesn't matter. He needs just something that he can claim as a victory and to make sure that these higher tariffs uh, don't kick in. We also got more evidence today of the weakness, ongoing weakness in the housing market. Pending home sales were down by 2.6%, much bigger than expected decline. I think they were actually looking for a flat number. This is the 10th month in a row that the year-over-year pending home sales numbers have been down. And in fact, pending home sales are now at the lowest level in over four years. So the housing market is is clearly in trouble. In fact, I believe a lot of the permits right that were taken out uh, I, I think the builders are going to choose not to build those permits, right? A lot of times people get excited. Oh, look, look, there's these building permits out there. Well, just because you have a permit to build doesn't mean you actually build. And I think a lot of developers, if they just survey the landscape, you know, they're going to, you know, they're going to have a second thought about that and they're going to decide not to build. So this market, the real estate market is going down. And if the Fed continues to hike rates, All they're doing is putting more nails in the real estate coffin, which is something that they don't want to do. Because, again, as much as they want to pretend that real estate is not a huge part of this bubble economy, it is. And as I said before, it's not just the construction industry and the jobs related to that. It's the wealth effect. It's all the consumption that flows from home equity and home equity extractions and mortgage refis and all this. And so if they let this bubble implode, well, they already saw that movie in 2008. They don't want to see it again. Now, it's going to happen. We're going to get the, 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 the uh, sequel. And as I've said many times about sequels, they're always worse than the original. So as bad as the 08 financial crisis was, the sequel is going to be much worse. Now, we did get the uh, numbers for Q3 GDP. The final number was unrevised at 3.5%. But um, one of the big factors there, you got to look beneath the, the numbers, was the, the build in inventories. You know, inventories continue to rise. And I think one of the reasons that inventories are rising is that uh, companies are trying to get a jump on the tariffs. And so if you know a lot of the products 
that you are importing may become subject to tariffs in the future. The key is, well, let's buy them now before the tariffs kick in, and then we'll be able to sell them later rather than wait and then have to pay the tariffs. Let's get them before the tariffs, and then we can, you know, increase the price to the consumer and we can keep the difference, right? Instead of having the difference go uh, to the U.S. government. And also another reason for the inventory build is likely because businesses are optimistic, right? Everybody thinks the economy is booming. Everybody thinks everything is great. So they want the inventories because they're confident that they'll be able to sell. And if you look at the inventories numbers we already got for October, a big jump, much bigger than expected jumps in wholesale and retail inventories. Now, of course, initially that pads the GDP because inventories are a component of GDP. But if inventories are building because sales aren't there, and if the, uh, the, the, the stores are more optimistic, if businesses are more optimistic on the demand that's coming from their customers, what does that mean about future GDP? Well, that means that uh, inventories are going to come down, that orders are going to come down because companies are going to be stuck with a bunch of merchandise that they haven't been able to sell. So all of this is just pulling GDP growth forward uh, and then pushing out uh, the recession. But the numbers are going to weaken. Again, that's going to be more and more pressure on the Fed, first not to raise rates and then to start cutting rates. What else is going on in the market today? Crude oil uh, actually made a new low. This was the first time for this correction or this move. I guess technically you'd call it a bear market, right? Because the decline is way more than uh, 20%. But we actually traded below 50. We got down to 49.41. I think was the low, but then we reversed. We closed around 51 and a half, so about a $2 move. So a potential reversal, you know, we took out some stops below 50, and rather than continuing to move lower, the market reversed and closed higher. So potentially we might have a, a good uh, floor here now at, um, at the $50 level in the price of crude. And if the Fed, of course, is going to be easier, then this is going to be bullish for all commodities, including crude, because it's negative for the dollar. And the dollar did get beat up yesterday. It didn't get destroyed, but it was a significant down day in the dollar yesterday. And I think we had a small follow through. At one point, the dollar was positive today, but I think it, it, it ended up with a, with a small uh, gain. One surprise was that gold didn't have a bigger move. I mean, initially, the price of gold jumped up by about 10 bucks or maybe 12 bucks because I think it was down $2 and then uh, Powell spoke and, and gold was up 10 bucks, but it only finished up about six or seven and it tacked on another four or five today. So not that big a move yet in the price of gold, because if the Fed really has changed its uh, monetary policy, then this is extremely bullish for gold. It's extremely bearish for the dollar. I think the markets there are a little cautious. And I think one of the reasons, though, that gold didn't have a bigger rise is because you had this 600 point gain in the in the Dow. And I think if people are excited about the stock market, that takes away some of the impetus for them to buy gold. And, and I so I think that was a problem. But if the stock market continues to roll over, which is what my expectation is. And now we have the expectation that the Fed is not going to be as aggressive with raising rates. That is a very, very bullish environment for the price of gold. Now, I don't think the price of gold needs the stock market to go down to go up because ultimately it's going to go up anyway uh, because the Fed is still going to be uh, backing away from its rate hikes and inflation is going to pick up and people are going to buy gold. But the gold rally will certainly be helped if we have a sell-off in other risk assets or, or risk assets like the stock market while people are are expecting the Fed to not be as aggressive. And in fact, further U.S. stock market weakness is only going to put more pressure on the Fed to do something else to stop the decline. Because after all, once this bullet doesn't work, right, once they simply say, okay, you know, we're almost at neutral, so we're not going to hike as much, if that doesn't work and the market keeps falling anyway, well, now they have to come back to the drawing board with something bigger in order to stop the decline. Because again, as much as they try to pretend they don't care, believe me, they care. And they don't want to admit that they care because that creates a whole other problem. So they have to keep their, their concerns private, but clearly it's obvious uh, what they're trying to do. Now, another market that might have put in a short-term bottom is Bitcoin. We finally got a bit of a rally in Bitcoin. And I don't think this is a long-term bottom, but there could be a little bit of a short-term bottom, probably in a hole just long enough to create enough false confidence that we've seen the lows. 
and maybe sucker some uh, some buying into the market so that you know the whales can unload more of their cryptocurrencies, which I think is their goal. Of course, they just they need other people to come in so they can get out. Now the initial low in Bitcoin was a little bit below 3,500. So we broke below 3,500, then we rallied. And then the next couple of times we went down into the 3,500s, we never got below 3,500. So that level seems to have held as a support level. And now overnight, we rallied back up above 4,400. So that's a pretty significant move off the lows. That's more of a significant rally than any of the rallies we've had since we broke below that, you know, 6,200, 6,400 support, wherever that was, and 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 hit and hit these lows. Now, as I am recording this, we're back below 4,200. So the market's not running away, but we may have established a trading range for a while with 3,500 on the low end, uh, you know, maybe 4,400. Uh, 4,500 on the high end, and we'll see how long we can stay in this range before we ultimately break down and go lower, because I do not believe that 3,500 is the low, not even close. I don't think this bear market in cryptocurrencies is over. In fact, I think it's just getting started, and I think we have a long way to go uh, before we, you know, we bottom out. And certainly a long way before we see any kind of capitulation, before we see any of the hodlers actually admitting that uh, that the that the party is over and that this was a bubble. As of right now, some of them might be upset that some of their paper wealth is gone, uh, but most of them just think it's just a matter of time before it comes back. I mean, clearly people wish they had sold so they can buy back in now. I mean, obviously, right? People wish they had you know you know taken some profits at twenty thousand or anywhere near there and bought them back. I mean, of course, people can have those woulda, coulda, shouldas, but at the end of the day, they still think that you know. 20,000 was just a stop on the way to a million and all they have to do is keep on holding and they're going to be millionaires or billionaires. Well, we need to see them give up on that dream before you can claim that there's been any sort of capitulation. But, you know, I want to tell a little bit of a tax story about uh, Bitcoin because I was chatting today with a guy who um, moved to Puerto Rico because of Act 2022, which is to avoid uh, capital gains taxes. But he's a crypto guy. And it was his crypto gains in 2017, last year, that really prompted him to move to Puerto Rico. In fact, almost all the people, the crypto people that have come to Puerto Rico came this year. Right. I mean, it would have been great if they came in 2016, because then all the gains from 2017 would have been tax free. But most of them, the gains, most people... You know, the gains weren't big enough dollar wise. I mean, they were pretty big percentage wise, but dollar wise, the huge gains happened in 2017. And that's when a lot of people started thinking about the capital gains tax. And that's when a lot of people heard about Puerto Rico. Now, a lot of them heard about it from me being on Joe Rogan in 2017 and talking on that podcast about the tax benefits of uh, of being in Puerto Rico. So when Bitcoin had that huge run up to 20,000, everybody was super bullish at the end of 2017, early 2018 and a lot of people in mass in the crypto community headed over to Puerto Rico because they wanted to make sure that their future gains, which dollar-wise were going to be even bigger, right? If Bitcoin and all the other cryptos kept on moving up like everybody expected, this was going to be millions and millions or tens of millions of gains. And the idea of paying zero capital gains taxes uh, was very enticing. I mean, you know, and so a lot of people moved here to Puerto Rico. And so the reason I bring this up is I was chatting online with this guy. He's a member of uh, this Act 2022 Society, which I'm a member of, which is a group of people who, you know, main Americans from the mainland who moved to Puerto Rico, who now have these tax grants. You know, it's a society and it's just like an organization and you help each other out and they have meetings and helpful meetings and they have parties once in a while and stuff like that. So I'm a member of this organization. They also did a lot of charitable work gave millions and millions of dollars uh, in the aftermath of uh, Hurricane Maria. Um, and so they, they're, they're doing a lot of good work on the island, too, as far as uh, char- charitable giving. But in any event, so I'm on a message board with this guy who's talk- talking about his tax problem, and he's looking for some advice. And I started chatting with the guy. And the problem that he has, and this is a little bit of a tweak on the problem that other people had with cryptocurrencies. It wasn't even something that I that I thought about until this guy's situation came up. But anyway, so he moves to Puerto Rico in 2018. And early in 2018, when the cryptos are still way up, 
he sold a bunch and he had millions of dollars in gains, right? Now, since most of those gains happened in 2017, the gains happened before he moved to Puerto Rico. So any gains that you, when you realize a gain, any portion of the gain that took place before you got to Puerto Rico is still taxable. You still have to pay a capital gains tax on that. So if you want to think about it in the case of, let's say, Bitcoin, if you bought Bitcoin for $100 and when you moved to Puerto Rico, it was $15,000 and then you sold it at $17,000, the move from $15,000 to $17,000, that's tax-free. So you don't have to pay any taxes on that $2,000. But on the move from a hundred to you know to fifteen thousand, where it was when you got here, all of that gain is still taxable, just as if you were still living in the United States, because the gain happened before you got to Puerto Rico. So that's fine. He had a big gain, and now he has a tax. But here's the problem: once you become a Puerto Rican resident, all of your future capital gains are tax-free. That's the good part. The bad part is none of your losses uh, are are you able to use to offset the gains that you had from before you got there? So in other words, the market has crashed since he's made those initial sales. He has now had other sales at much lower levels. So now this guy has huge crypto realized losses that he has. And he has a lot of other crypto unrealized losses where he's still holding and hoping, right? He hasn't sold. But here's the problem. He's got this big tax bill for 2018 for the gains that he realized early in the year. But he can't offset any of those gains with these losses because these losses happened after he moved to Puerto Rico. Because at the point he moved to Puerto Rico, cryptocurrencies were way up there. So I'll just make up some numbers. These aren't the exact numbers. But let's say he realized $2 million of gains in January of this year. And now... Later in the year, he sold other cryptocurrencies and he lost $3 million. It's in the same tax year. So if he had stayed in America, right, he'd have a $2 million gain in January. He has a $3 million loss in December. Doesn't owe any taxes. In fact, he has a $1 million loss carry forward against future years, right? But because he moved to Puerto Rico, he has to pay taxes on the $2 million gain, but he's got no write-off. He can't do anything with the $3 million loss. So he's actually stuck. So talk about the best laid plans of mice and men, right? He came over here because this is great. I'm going to have all these gains. I'm not going to have to pay any taxes. And you know what? Now he's got a bunch of losses that he can't use. And now he has a big tax bill and he might not have the money. Now, my advice to this guy, and I hopefully he can do it, and I'm not really sure you know, what the deal is. I said, look, don't be a resident of Puerto Rico. Even though you lived here, just don't claim the status. And I said, talk to uh, a lawyer about to make sure how you could do that, or maybe you cannot declare your residency until next year, until 2019, so that you can still be a resident of whatever state that you lived in before you got here, so that he can still use all the losses that he has later in the year to offset the gains that he realized early in the year. But I don't know to the extent that he can do that. Will it screw up his uh, Act 22 grant, which is what you need to have in order to be exempt uh, from the local Puerto Rico capital gains taxes? So he's got all, you know, it's a whole mess that now he's got to untangle. But again, this is the problem, right? Nobody expects this. Everybody was so excited, so optimistic about crypto just doing nothing but going up and all they can see are gains and they come to Puerto Rico and now they actually have a big tax problem because potentially if he can't undo this, if he's stuck being a Puerto Rico resident, then it's a nightmare. And the other thing is, if he can delay his residency or if he can not be a resident, does he somehow screw up his ability to become a Puerto Rican resident uh, with the tax grant if he's able to delay it? I don't know. Hopefully he'll be able to do that and he'll be able to get, get out of this mess. But, you know, there are a lot of people, again, that do not understand the significance of their tax problems. A lot of people didn't pay gains in 2017, and a lot of people may have uh, uh, harvested gains in 2018. For most people, that's better. Because if you have gains that you harvested in January or February of this year, you can write off the losses uh, from later in the year. Where people are going to be in trouble is where they book gains in the tax year of 2017, right? 
and now they lost all their money in 2018. As I said on a prior podcast, when I talked about some other guy that was in the hole, you can't do that. You can't carry backwards. You owe the taxes in the year that you get the gain. It's only the losses that you can move forward, not the gains. So if you gained a lot of money in 2017, you owe the taxes. Even if you lost all those gains back in 2018, the IRS doesn't care. They want their tax money on the gains from 2017. But in this guy's situation, because of this Puerto Rican move, you can't even use the losses in 2018 to offset the gains in 2018 because he moved uh, to Puerto Rico. So like I always say, you know, be careful what you wish for because you just might get it. (laughs) Thank <laughs> you.